Hey there. Welcome to the first look. Thank you for being here today. It's uh, it's August, but it's it's feeling like I'm gonna jinx it. I realize uh, it's feeling kind of fally today. It's like cooled down significantly, uh, and just just that I think is kind of enough to give me a little bit of hope about um, us moving into my favorite season, which is the fall. Uh, anyway, thank you for being here. And um, so I think that I have to check my notes. I'm going to check my notes as we're talking. Um, but we're getting close to the end of this series that we're on. Um, it was a, a short series intentionally, uh, just to kind of give you a sense of, yep, this is the end of the series. Um, but we're near the end of the book, so that makes sense. This, is, uh, this has been a, a quick series on the book of Ephesians before we get kind of back into the Gospels. And I've, I always appreciate being able to do a series on a book like this because, again, the letters of Paul or um, the prophets, especially the minor prophets, they all kind of tend to blend together for us. Like they, because um, they're covering like overlapping subjects and that kind of thing. And so I think any time that we get a chance to say, what does this one specifically say and how is it different than this one over here, um, I think is valuable, at least for me as a, someone who studies scripture. So this chapter, uh, chapter six of Ephesians, kind of wraps up um, the book. And it's I think it's interesting because it kind of ends in a way that it really hasn't spoken almost the entire time. Uh, I think the interesting thing about this book is, um, or about this particular uh, chapter in Ephesians, is that it really uses some analogies and some um, ways of understanding our faith that are unique to the book, but not unique to what's happening in Ephesus. And the only way you know that or care about that is if you do what we have done, which is first study the book for what it is, um, try to understand the context of the book, do a little bit to um, look around and see what was Paul dealing with, what, what other stories do we have, and then try to understand how the way he approaches that should affect the way we understand our faith. And um, so I'm going to kind of refer back and forth to um, the rest of the book that we've looked at, but then also, um, you know, the passage in Acts that kind of uh, gives us some of the context for, you know, what's happening in Ephesus. So this passage, I think, is, is a pretty famous one in the sense that you, you'll probably know you'll get the references and I think it's because there were Sunday school type um, Sunday school type songs that went with it it's about the armor of God okay and like putting on the armor of God at least I think when I was in that stage of life that those songs or a song like that was popular in Sunday school and I think it's one of those passages that's that's easy to talk about um with kids because they know what armor looks like, you know, whether it's like Knights of the Round Table or, um, you know, whatever it happens to be. Like, people know what armor looks like, um, whether it's, you know, for, for war or battle or defense or, um, you know, peacekeeping or whatever it happens to be. Um, and so we have, they have a sense of that. And so you use that imagery, right? And also because it makes us feel kind of safe and strong and kids need to feel safe and strong, especially in a world that they're trying to navigate and can be scary. And so it makes sense why you talk about that. But also, of course, putting on the armor of God feels a lot like warfare, you know. And there's something kind of fearful and aggressive and... Um, you know, violent about that imagery. And that's, for some people, that's a very comfortable place to be. Um, 
maybe because you're a veteran or maybe because you live through periods of time or in areas of the world where violence is a, a part of life that you know more than you should. Um, or, you know, it might just be that that's just something that you connect with, but, what, you know, whatever the case may be, it, it might be a comfortable image for you, and then for other people, it's a very kind of, um, it's an aggressive image, and it, it can kind of make you feel something that you don't want to feel. And I, I never try to take any of that for granted. I think the imagery that we see in the Bible is something to always um, try to see from different types of perspectives because people have different experiences with it. Just like, um, you know, we shouldn't take for granted that everyone knows uh, what it means to be a, you know, a shepherd or a farmer, or not everyone has, you know, uh, when we talk about God, you know, we use different names for God because not everybody has the same relationship with um, their father or their mother or their sibling or their family or, you know, whatever. Like, we talk about those different things because people need different ways of interacting with the concept of who God is. Um, and so different images are used because people have very different experiences. And I think this is one of those. So you either feel very comfortable with this imagery or maybe you don't connect with it at all or it feels kind of like, like, okay, I know that it's in there, but that's not really for me. And so I want to, you know, point that out and respect it. Um, but in this passage, I think you see kind of a, kind of a pivot. And I think the pivot that you see in it makes knowing the passage that we read in the book of Acts, uh, the first sermon, uh, right there in the beginning of August, really, really important. So if you have the time, um, I'm not going to read all that to you, but I think it was, um, I'm going to try to find it as I'm talking to you. Um, I think the passage was like in Acts 9 or 11 or something like that. I'm going to try to look it up right now. But the passage kind of talks about the, the conflict that was present in Ephesus at the time when um, uh, when, sorry, when Paul was in Ephesus. Um, there was conflict around him being there. There was conflict around, um, you know, like the, just his presence. And so I'm trying to find it. It might have been later on. Maybe it's like 19 or something. I'm going to trust, oh uh, yeah, it's Acts 19. Okay. So if you, if you need a reference, this might be a good place to pause. Pause. And uh, go read Acts 19. That will give you the reference point. So, um, the reference I made in the first sermon about Ephesians was that um, uh, Ephesus had seen a lot of conflict as different empires took control of this and that because it was such an important uh, port city in the Asia Minor, minor present-day Turkey area. And so, uh, a lot of different people have kind of claimed it. And um, Paul, in his message of the gospel, and Jesus disrupted um, those individuals who, one, who had gotten used to, um, you know, Roman and Greek imagery of gods, um, and people who had made a, a, a livelihood of creating statues to these gods. And so um, protests had kind of sprung up and um, a lot of like fighting and that kind of thing and Paul eventually left. And so that conflict is um, a big part of what influences the book itself. Um, so the book of Ephesians kind of addresses our need for individual, especially individual um, conflict resolution and the willingness to live in, in peace with each other talks a lot about that, about, um, and there's a phrase that gets used um, 
right before our text for today that's, um, that's important. And um, I'm going I'm to look it up so that I can quote it correctly. Um, and so the, the theme of Ephesians is, is about how to find that mutual respect. And so, um, in Ephesians goes, you goes to great lengths, Paul goes to great lengths in Ephesians to, um, to hammer this point home as much as he can. So in Ephesians 5, 21, the, the sort of subheading is, be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Okay, be subject to one another, mutually. Okay. There's a, a, a mutual subject to one another, right? And if I had to say what the theme of Ephesians is, it's it's 521. Uh, because everything leading up to it and everything afterwards kind of points to it. So what happens is in chapter 5, um, Paul says, Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then he uses some examples about how to do that, practical examples, um, ones that people would be familiar with, regardless of whether you were urban or suburban, Gentile or Jew, it wouldn't matter. Like, um, these would be uh, very tangible ways of understanding. But also, um, kind of controversial. So the first one, is wives be subject to your husbands as you are to the Lord, and then um, husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Right. Now that's a that's controversial in a more um, modern context because it talks about wives being subject to their husbands, and that's you know uh, problematic and, and um, uh, difficult to hear for all the reasons it is. Um, but trying to take it with a grain of salt, with the concept of be subject to one another. The, the language in there, I think, is hard to kind of parse, but there is some language in there that says, wives, be subject to your husbands. Husbands, give yourself up for your wives. Um, there's a mutual kind of um, being subject, mutual care for each other. Now, you know, this is a very patriarchal society, especially then, especially there, in, you know, Jerusalem is the same. Um, and so anything that spoke to um, husbands, love your wives and give yourselves up for them as Christ gives himself up for the church, that is at least a step in a direction towards the kind of equality that we would still advocate for today. And so it's it's in there. I understand where it's problematic. I'm, you know, I'm saying that's what the passage is. The next part I think goes even further than that in terms of trying to uh, a, a mutual um, uh, kind of mutual care for one, for each other. Children, obey your parents and the Lord for there, for this is right. Okay, honor your father, honor your mother. And then it says, And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Um, again, it, it doesn't go as far as maybe, you know, we might talk about the value of children and caring for them in the ways that we do, but it does lift children up as, you know, human beings who need to be cared for, uh, not, to be, not to be provoked, not to just be, you know, the, uh, the recipients of their father's anger um, and, and so to watch out for them you know be those who instruct and be those who, who give care and discipline as, as we see in Christ um, and so there's a, a value to the to you know those relationships that, that's emphasized in this passage um, and there's something similar than that right after that so there's husbands and wives there's children and parents, and then there's slaves and masters. Um, slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling and, and singleness of heart as you obey Christ. And masters, do the same to them. Stop threatening them, for you know 
that both of you have the same master in heaven. That's a huge thing to say. It may not sound like a huge thing for us to hear. Treat them like human beings. But at the time, right, everything in context, there is a power to it. Now, any critique of what I'm saying or any critique of those passages is fair. Um, but I'm trying to look at it in context and say, you know, how far does it go given the circumstance? So, things to kind of just think about. So, that passage that I talked about, um, 521, again, I think is the crux of the entire book. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's the majority of the book. But then you get to our passage um, for today. After all that, this is kind of the, we're getting close to the end, right? The end is uh, 21 through 24 is like a, um, kind of a benediction, okay? So this is, what we're about to read is basically the end of the book. And I think that the power of it comes in what we know about what's happening um, in Ephesus because of what we read in Acts 19, which you read in Acts 19. We see the conflict and we see um, what Paul is trying to get them prepared for. Be subject to one another. And now here's the kind of um, fortitude that you're going to need to do that. Right? You live in a, in a context that is, you know, it's urban, it's, uh, you know, highly, uh, there's a high uh, density, uh, big population, diverse population. Uh, you know, conflicts are going to happen, right? Uh, but be subject to one another and find your strength in God. And so here's the analogy that is used to, to fortify them, right? To give them strength starting in verse 10 of chapter 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Meaning, we can get what we're battling isn't first and foremost, at least for Paul, what's happening around us, human beings, politics, and what have you. Um, but it's a, you know, we have to get right within ourselves. You know, we, if we, we, we can't do that other work if we're not right within ourselves. And I think that, for me, is kind of the crucial part of everything he's about to say. Because he spends all of these chapters talking about relationships, be subject to one another. And then he ends with this cry for strength, right? So, you know, if you're going to go and do that work, you have to be right within yourself, emotionally, spiritually, right? Um, therefore take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm um, stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth so the analogies don't really matter but here's what you should do stand for truth for the breastplate of righteousness of truth and righteousness as shoes for your feet put on whatever you will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace, gospel of peace, right? With all of these, take up the shield of faith, with you be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is in the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times and in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication 
for all the saints. Pray also for me, because again, he was basically run out of town. Right? Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in claims in chains. Excuse me. Pray that I may declare it boldly, as I must speak. Right? Because again, if you read. Acts 19, what you see is that he's, he gets in the middle of this conflict and he has to be driven out, and since then he's been, you know, in these kind of um, political, social, legal battles, uh, and, you know, he's found himself in prison, what have you. So, what he's, if we kind of sift out the analogies for a second, um, this is what he says. Um, stand therefore with these things in your hearts truth um, righteousness proclaiming the gospel of peace be those who speak of salvation of the spirit and of the word of God right? pray in the spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication right? so all of that is is very personal, right? And if you if you've been around me at any length of time, you know that a, a lot of what I tend to, to gravitate towards is how we collectively do things, right? The the kind of social element, corporate element of our of our faith, um, because um, the what I think we are often um, led to do because we're, you know, we're bound together as people of faith, we're bound together as a church, uh, we're people who are of, um, you know, of the kind of promises that, that God makes um, to collective peoples. Um, yeah, I tend to talk about the ways that we can collectively work towards um, a better world and looking out for, for the least of these. Um, but very often, what we also need to, to um, yoke with that is a way of understanding how we need to be working on ourselves individually. Um, you know, we... I think that one of the hardest elements to our faith is that we're kind of, sometimes we feel like we're not good enough or, or we're not smart enough or we don't know enough scripture or whatever. We tend to get down on ourselves and we don't feel like we can do anything. Um, you're never going to have it completely right. You're never going to know it all. Um, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be working on yourself. You know, it doesn't mean you shouldn't be seeking out for yourself. Um, a sense of why do I believe what I believe? Why do I do what I do? Why do I say what I say? Why do I think what I think? Um, that should always be a part of our um, part of the way that we understand ourselves. We do that a lot in Lent, where we talk, think about you know our own process, and um, and that's that should be a part of our discipleship. Is constantly checking in with ourselves to see what do I need, where do I need to go. How do I, how do I grow? Right? And I think that what I, I like about the way that Ephesians talks about this, even though some of the analogies are difficult, right? Um, you know, talking about um, spouses and talking about parents and children and talking about you know um, slaves and masters. That that's a, that's a hard thing to kind of work through, um, and it you know it has its problems and it has its difficult places to kind of. And we, don't, we shouldn't steer away from it. We, should, we have to be able to say, yeah, it's, it's in there and this is what I do with it. This is what I can do from it. Without making excuses for the fact that, you know, we don't live in a world where we accept um, second-class citizenship, where we accept abuse of children in any form, where we accept, um, you know, violence is something that's just okay and, like, and you know, the, deal of the, the world has always been violent. Um, you know, it's important for us to continue to um, 
grow as individual people and as a society. Um, but what I like about Ephesians is the fact that it says, look, be subject to one another, work on those relationships, while at the same time recognizing that those relationships, whether individual or collective, are not going to get better uh, unless we are willing to work on ourselves. And I, I think that's a, a kind of amazing piece of it. And I think Paul is, um, I've been here long enough to know that yeah, some of you really, really appreciate his writing, and some of you are like, you know, Paul kind of rubs me the wrong way, and I, I get all that. I believe I'm with you in, in working through that. Because um, sometimes he gets a little heady or, or a little, uh, like, like, you know, kind of big on himself, right? He's like, it's like that sometimes. At least that's the way it's translated. And, uh, but I, you should always be willing to say, look, I, I'm willing to work through this and not run away from it and not make excuses for it. Um, and kind of work through that with humility and optimism. Because um, the more, the longer I do this, the more I talk to young people especially, especially younger people in my life who the church has been something that they really connect with. Part of, part of what I hear people talk about is, one, they don't know that not all Christians think the same on given subjects, and two, um, they want authenticity. You know, they want you to be able to say, yeah, here's, here's where this is hard. Let's talk about what's hard. Because life is hard, right? Life doesn't come with clear, you know, easy black and white answers. So let's not talk about the Bible like it's not that. And that's a lot of what I see. And that's a, a lot of the way I try to approach Scripture is with that in mind. Genuine authenticity, curiosity, um, and humility where I can. So that, that's what I'm thinking about this week. That's, that's where I'm at. So, um, I hope that's helpful as you're thinking through this book. Um, I hope that this has been a valuable series. I know it's been sh relatively short, but uh, I'm glad that we're kind of rounding out the month like this. Thank you for doing it. Thanks for thinking through it. I hope that you have a wonderful week. I think that's all I have for you this time. So uh, take care of yourselves, and uh, I will see you next time for another first look. So take care.